I'm James Lawler, and you are listening to Climate Now. This episode is part of our Decarbonizing Transportation series, which is co-hosted by my friend Darren Howe, who is a senior charging manager at Cruise and a former applications engineer at Tesla. Thanks, James. To give some context for today's episode, transportation accounts for about 20% of global CO2 emissions, and nearly 75% of that comes from road transportation, which is why we're focusing on this for our Decarbonizing Transportation series first. Today is exciting because we're hearing from three different experts working to improve the efficiency of freight vehicles like trucks. Medium and heavy duty freight accounts for about 25% of all transportation emissions, so they are important to decarbonize. All three of our experts today are or were a part of the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, or NACFI for short. So we'll be hearing from Mike Roth, who is the executive director at NACFI about the current state of the trucking industry. How many trucks are on the road? What are their emissions? Mike will also share with us the results of the run on less electric trucking demonstration, which tested the potential of real electric trucks on real trucking routes. NACFI's Director of Emerging Technology Studies, Rick Mihalik, will walk us through the primary technologies that could play a role in decarbonizing the industry and the costs and infrastructural challenges of adopting them. And then Jesse Lund, who is a former electric truck manager at NACFI, will give us a deep dive into the development of the electric truck over the last few years and the challenges and opportunities for electric trucking in the future. At the time of this interview, Jesse was also a senior associate for the Carbon Free Mobility Program at the Rocky Mountain Institute, or RMI. She is now a trucking and off-road lead project manager at CalStart. We had separate conversations with each of our guests and pulled those together to create this episode. Since each of our guests is associated with NACFI, let's start by getting a sense of the role NACFI plays in advising the North American trucking industry and how it got started. Here's Mike Roth. So we were started when fuel prices started to increase, you know, and it, it, it's amazing that 12 years ago was the first time fuel for these trucks really got above a dollar and a half a gallon, you know, and they went to $4 and stayed there until they dropped off a bit. But, you know, that, that meant that these, um, particularly these heavy tractor trailers out on the freeway, you know, they, they were to a point where they were burning sixty seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in fuel per year. And to put that in context, you'll spend as much money in fuel in two years as the heavy duty tr- tractor cost you. Um, basically, that'll never happen in a car. That makes it a, a very big cost. And so the organization was launched to help fleets make decisions, manufacturers bring products better. Um, ultimately, you know, because we were starting the greenhouse gas phase one and two regulations in the U.S. So we were part of that in the early days just to help the industry think about the uh, fuel economy opportunities and efficiency that existed. You know, in the last few years, we've expanded down into smaller trucks, e- into e-commerce vans and so forth. And about four years ago, we launched a, a second stream, really, of guiding emerging change, we called it. So as electric trucks, now hydrogen, autonomy, connectivity, and how that helps us route these trucks, as those start to emerge, uh, we, we feel we're well positioned to help uh, guide the industry a bit. While we continue to do work on making decisions on truck purchases with technologies that are available right now. I see. So, so you have relationships with all the major fleets then I'm assuming, and, and they come and you provide guidance to your membership on all of the issues that you just mentioned. Is that exactly right? So we're, okay. we're pretty, we're pretty embedded and quite credible inside the, the trucking industry. So manufacturers, fleets, component manufacturers, and then really more of the logistics world and so forth. So uh, we're trusted and that helps a lot as we do our work. So our, our you know theory of change is to work with the early adopters, learn what they're doing, monetize that in a total cost of ownership, and then share that out. So we can, we can really have fast followers on these technologies. Cool. So I wonder if you could give us a sense of the trucking industry today in North America. You know, how many trucks are on the road and any sort of subdivision of that number, maybe by routes or, you know, what most of the activities of these trucks are, just kind of to give people who maybe, you know, we've, we've all seen trucks on the road, but we may not have a sense of exactly how big an industry we're talking about. Yeah, so relative to passenger car, it's small, right? But relative to, uh, you know, what it does for us as a, as a society, it's pretty big because it moves literally everything that we buy is, is you know, hauled by a truck. And so, uh, you know, in, in the U.S., I'll just stay very 
specific there. Mm -hmm. um, heavy tractor trailers, there's about, uh, you know, two and a half million of those hauling goods around our uh, country. A misnomer that they're all, you know, sleeper trucks that have disparate routes and the truckers sleep in the truck stops in the truck every night. That's still the predominant, you know, we call that truck load disparate routes, long haul is typically called that, but there's a growing segment. And there's always been a part of it where it's more called regional haul, return to base, heavy tractors, the UPSs, FedExs, Amazons, they tend to, to run those routes where they go out and come back. And that's important uh, around electrification. But then as we get down to smaller trucks, there's class six medium duty box trucks where there's, you know, money, a lot less trucks than there were 20 years ago. That used to be a much bigger market. And then there's like four, four to five million step vans, vans, you know, small class three, four and five trucks. And that's growing with our, with our e-commerce. So what we've seen is trucks getting smaller and trucks getting bigger. And so think about the box stores being serviced by, you know, heavy tractors, small heavy tractors and then there's the uh, the smaller trucks in our neighborhoods so that that's kind of how it's how it's broken up it's pretty diverse or different you know a truck in and state of new york sometimes will be different than you know a, a texas truck because of state laws and you know it's not as simple as um, interstate commerce and everything's everything's the same so challenging market but what kind of uh, it makes it fun and actually, do you happen to know what percentage of emissions comes from the heavier trucks like class eight versus all of the other classes that are easier to electrify? Yeah, we've, we've got it in our infographic, which I haven't really pulled up, but it's pretty close to the 2080 rule. I mean, you know, I rattled off some, some uh, population numbers of class three to class eight a little bit earlier. And if you just think about it, right, that, that, that van that's going to drop off all of your Amazon packages today. Don't tell me you don't have one coming to your house. <laughs> that truck will do, you know, 30, 40 miles in that long haul diesel truck or that long haul truck will do, uh, you know, like I said, 500 miles. So, you know, 20, 80, 15, 85, something like that. The heavy trucks with the longer miles and the um, more fuel burn is, um, you know, even though they're a smaller part of the population are burning the, the vast majority of the fuel, creating a lot of emissions. Okay, got it. So the hardest piece here and the largest emitting piece of the pie is long haul trucking with maybe something around 80% of all of those emissions. So that's helpful context. Well, I think you were just starting to allude to this, but you started talking about how different types of fleets see electrification differently. Could you tell us a little bit more of how truck drivers and companies think about decarbonizing trucking? Is there yeah. a method for certain types of fleets? Well, first of all, uh, if you asked me that question five years ago, maybe even three years ago, Darren, it, I would have a vastly different answer. The industry is definitely working on being more sustainable and moving freight. And, you know, decarbonization even comes up in, you know, the trucking events that I go to that are very trucking events, right? I, I refute that this is a hard debate, hard to abate industry. This is an industry that has a relatively short life. I mean, the truck is 10, 12 year life. You know, maybe it'll stick around for 15 or 16 years, but it, it is doing very low miles. The first 10 years, it's getting most of its miles. So that's not that long. Secondly, I'm finding that the industry, you know, wants to do this. And we're starting to see, and we'll talk about it here in a minute with our Run on Less Electric event, the, uh, these electric trucks are wonderful to drive. We're already seeing the benefits of maintenance and repair with them being a simpler truck. And the operations teams are, are really asking, you know, you give them one, two, five, 10 trucks, and they pretty quickly want to replace all 50 or 100 at their site. That's not a good news for the utilities because they're going to need a lot of power. But, you know, I, I kind of jump quickly to electric trucks there, Darren. But, but this, isn't, this isn't the old trucking industry. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's interesting because you just said, you know, it's going to be a challenge for utilities, certainly. But sometimes I'm surprised it should be a huge opportunity for utilities as well, given they're basically <laughs> taking oil and gas business, right? you know, uh, preach brother, because I don't get it myself. I, I think they're just so as I'm learning the utility markets and so forth, you know, it is it is complex and long term, but it seems to me, yeah, exactly. I mean, replacing oil and gas, I mean, come on, if given that opportunity, you know, we should jump on it. Mike recommended we talk with NACFI's Director of Emerging Technology Studies, Rick Mihalik, to get a better sense of the other technologies at play in the decarbonization game. Rick Mihalik is the Director of Emerging Technology Studies at the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. So we asked Rick what he thought about the potential technologies for decarbonizing trucking. Which of these technologies was likely to prevail? Well, 
I started framing that discussion in terms of how you would picture horses. All the competing technologies typically get talked about as if it's a horse race. And each one is, it has the potential of being the winner. And that's kind of a, a business approach to looking at it, that uh, you're an investor and you want to make money. And it's not really the approach from a society viewpoint. From a society viewpoint, it's really a team pulling a wagon. And we're the wagon. And the team of horses includes battery electric. It includes hybrid electric. It includes diesels that are running on renewable fuels. When you say renewable fuels, renewable diesel, renewable natural gas, are you referring to biodiesel or biofuel grown from plants? There's biofuels and there's synthetic fuels, right? Both of them are you know, chemically identical to the diesel as far as running an engine, mm -hmm. but they are generated not from fossil fuels, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have the emissions issues that you do with the fossil fuel-based diesel and natural gas. Right. So in this metaphor of the wagon and the group of horses, where each horse is a technology that's pulling us toward net zero, how mature are these different horses today? How developed are the different technologies? Fundamentally, uh, they've all got risks and issues and challenges, right? They're, they're, the reason we're looking at all these different technologies is that there are no sure things in the future. So battery electric has probably got the, the greatest maturity going forward because you have this vast amount of work that's gone on with automotive battery electric vehicles over the last uh, 15, 20 years. So you have a pretty good footprint there of a technology that works in automotive and should work in trucking, but it has, it has some uh, limitations. It can't do everything that a diesel truck can do because the, the batteries tend to be very heavy and you end up exchanging freight for uh, the weight of the vehicle at some point. And they also have limitations on uh, the range. So a lot of the vehicles we're looking at right now, prototypes are maybe 200 miles, 300 miles in, in range. Mm -hmm. And you know, batteries are gonna continue to improve and they're gonna get better, but that places a limitation on some of the operations. Natural gas engines have been around for a while. And so the renewable side of running uh, renewable diesel and renewable natural gas, that's pretty well developed too. There's probably uh, where electric vehicles, there may be uh, less than 200 out there that are class eight. You know, natural gas, there's, there's probably a few thousand out there hmm. because they've been being built for some time in their production. Those vehicles have an advantage in that they they don't really need a lot of change in order to run off of the renewable fuel, right? So it's a plug and play solution that gets you to a better emission solution, but not a perfect emission solution. Uh, if you look at fuel cells, they've been out since the 1960s in the space program. They've been used extensively for years. They went into transportation vehicles in the 2000 timeframe in buses. The technology is pretty mature. It's the application in heavy duty trucking that's new. And that's really not a technology issue. It's, it's just proving out the reliability, the functionality for a duty cycle that's different than they, they were originally developed for. There's a handful of those out there in prototypes right now, uh, mostly in Southern California, where there's a hydrogen infrastructure and the willingness for the state to be trying these out and fleets to be trying it out, largely in drage operations. Mm. The other technologies, you know, hybrids, if you take a look at the uh, Prius, it's been around for for a long time. <laughs> I was looking at the builder history on it. It's, it's almost 20 years that it's been in production, mm. right? So using a hybrid in a trucking um, you know, application is just another one of these situations where you're applying known technology to a new duty cycle, and you just need to, um, you know, work the bugs out of it and make sure that, that it meets the reliability and the, the lifespan. I don't really have a good count on the numbers, but I would say there's probably less than a few hundred 
of all the different hybrids that are, are being conceived right now, but they're all viable. I'm an engineer and, you know, when somebody says it's impossible, it just means that they haven't thought about it. Well, hey, Rick, I know you're not in the position of picking, you know, winners and losers here. Uh, you're really trying to develop that ecosystem that enables the right technology to fit in the right use case. But I did have a question around hydrogen fuel cells and the general, like, I guess, manufacturing and scaling landscape. According to NACV reports, if electric vehicles are actually suitable for, you know, maybe greater than 50% of even heavy duty trucking applications. And if you take a look at just the cost of green hydrogen, which I think today, if you're really, really ambitious, you can get to $8 per kilogram. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. And projections are maybe we can, you know, have that, you know, in, in the next five to 10 years. E- even with those costs, it seems like the, the total cost of ownership of those trucks is, is, is pretty tough. And the truck sales market is just not that big every year. So, so how can the hydrogen fuel cell uh, industry maybe scale to be economical? Why wouldn't people just stick with RNG and diesel until battery electric improves enough? Scale for hydrogen is, is a lot more than looking at the trucks. If you focus only on transportation, even if every truck was a fuel cell truck, the volumes just aren't there in terms of creating enough fuel to get the pricing down. The, you have to think of hydrogen as a regional solution or a national solution. So like Germany has a hydrogen plan. It's focused on getting hydrogen into cement mixing and steel making and all these other applications where they need to get away from fossil fuels. In parallel with that, once you have the infrastructure in place to get these high volume users, the amount of hydrogen they need, you can tap hydrogen off to run transportation fairly cost effectively. But if you're using transportation as the as the basis for justifying hydrogen, you'll never get there because it's just the numbers just aren't there in terms of the vehicle miles, amount of fuel used. It's pretty small compared to the overall need for hydrogen to scale. Let's talk about costs. What are the major factors that a fleet operator thinks about in terms of the total cost of ownership or TCO? And uh, what are the major differences when you talk about these different technologies, whether it's electric, hydrogen, renewable gas, et cetera. Total cost of ownership traditionally for fleets going back years and years, you really looked at the purchase price, which is the capital to buy it. And then you looked at at an estimate of the operating cost because you keep track of these vehicles on the road, you know how much fuel goes into it. You have some idea of the maintenance costs because you're you're doing that. Um, And then you have this magic thing called residual value. So at the end of your ownership period, you trade it in on another vehicle and you expect that it's worth something at that point in time. So that's traditional TCO is really those four factors. What has evolved in the last uh, decade is the realization that TCO is a much bigger issue because you have to think of it in terms of the company's TCO on the investment, dealing with uh, your sustainability goals, your overall use of uh, things like, um, you know, how, how much money you're spending disposing of waste oil at a maintenance facility. That typically wasn't thrown into the equation before, but there's an actual cost in dealing with properly handling that waste material, right, so that it doesn't damage the environment. There's other soft costs in there uh, dealing with getting people to um, be drivers, be maintenance people, and keeping them on staff. There's always been a huge turnover in drivers and maintenance people. One of the thoughts is that electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles, because they're new and technology uh, is is kind of exciting, is that it's gonna bring more people into the world of driving and and, and technicians. And if if a company has an electric truck versus another fleet that doesn't have an electric truck, that may be a a cost advantage. It takes a lot of money to actually bring in a person, train him for her, and and then keep them on staff. That's a cost that in the past wasn't really rolled into the TCO of the vehicle, but it now probably is part of the TCO of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So fuel cells are, uh, you know, 
not quite out there in enough uh, volume yet to really have a measurement on how how they're affecting TCO. We don't really have a lot of real production costs on them. The most of those trucks look like they're going into production in 2024 time frame or later, and so you're not going to really see uh, MSRP costs on those vehicles for a while. Electric vehicles are going into production now. And there are vehicles in the medium duty and, and light duty that are for sale. And so you can get actual costs on those. The list price of those is not what you pay. So it's a little bit deceiving. The list price is, is, has, has to be factored in against, uh, the, again, the total cost of ownership. And, and there are grants and incentives that help with getting the vehicle out the door. And then there are things like in California called low carbon fuel standard credits, which actually pay you for driving that truck over time. So you actually get positive cash flow over time by owning the vehicle, hmm. in, in depending on you know if you own the the fueling structure for it. Oh right, yes. So um, you know it's a it it's TCO is a lot more complicated, and then. Nobody really knows what the residual value of these vehicles is going to be. Um, one theory that I've been pushing is that these vehicles have lower maintenance. They have lower mo moving parts. They are probably going to last longer and have less maintenance over time. So that maintenance cycle is what dictated that the first owner typically traded that vehicle in at three to five years. If that maintenance period is actually going to extend that first owner out to five or eight years, he or she may become the owner for life. It may not actually make sense to trade the vehicle in if it actually has a long enough life with low enough maintenance costs. Right. So a first owner is the only owner, and then residual value no longer matters because it's zero at the end of that life. Yeah, that's very interesting. And of course, if you take into account things like battery degradation then you also want to make sure that fleet has a use case for like a slightly sl a smaller range. Right. You know, most of the battery manufacturers and the vehicle manufacturers are, are coming across and saying that the battery is going to last the life of the vehicle. Mm. Uh, but as you said, uh, you, you have to account for the fact that as these batteries age, they, they tend to uh, have less capacity. So, you know, that number is where they, they are no longer good for a vehicle. It's usually said, they, they say it's 80%. Some companies say 70%. So you have to think about when you spec a vehicle for 100 miles and you want to use that vehicle for 100 miles for the next 10 years, you need a battery that can probably do 120 miles when you buy the truck so that at the end of 10 years, you can still go 100 miles with it. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, you change the duty cycle uh, as the battery fades into less and less demanding distances. Mm -hmm. and that's not unusual. That's how UPS does their, their delivery trucks, their uh, what they call package trucks, the vans. Um, they tend to start with uh, one duty cycle and they end their lives 20 years later in another duty cycle that's less demanding. Got it. So people are already doing this to some extent. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into the infrastructure side of the TCO. So since we're talking about this, maybe horse race, uh, you know, if we do have that three-way horse race between electric, hydrogen, and renewable-based fuels, wouldn't that increase the complexity of whoever's building that infrastructure, whether that's at truck stops or depots? Now you have to provide for three types of fuel instead of maybe one or two. Yeah, you can see that today. Uh... There are truck stops that service both diesel and then they, they have uh, natural gas on site. And you can see that it's added complexity to the infrastructure because they have to have a separate facility for the natural gas. Those facilities also, if you look closely, they have propane typically. So there are tanks of propane in different parts of the facility to fuel those vehicles that have a need for propane. Right, so um, that's just kind of the nature of that line of business. They also fuel cars, right? So they have 
different forms of gasoline. And then uh, a couple of the truck stops that I drive by um, in Texas have actually put in uh, electrification. So I, I, I don't see it as a, as a roadblock to an industry that's already been dealing with complexity. It's more a challenge of scaling and the fact that uh, an electric vehicle is going to be a different beast to fuel because they have to sit for a while to get fuel today. The parking lots are going to have to be different. You, you don't have pull through charging, for example, in a, in a large parking lot. You're going to have them pull up to a uh, basically a parking meter and plug in. And then they're going to have to figure out how to back out or get out. So there's a, there's a lot that's not really figured out yet on specking the uh, fueling facilities. Uh, Daimler has a pull through facility in Portland called called the Electric Island, but it, it it's only uh, it's only dealing with three or four trucks at a time. Yeah, and these truck stops are like they serve like twenty trucks and they have parking for like hundreds sometimes. Yes, there you know a typical uh, truck stop has parking for maybe two, 200 to 400 trucks. And uh, they have fuel pumps servicing maybe uh, anywhere from 15 to, I've seen 40 or 50 fueling stations and some of the really big ones operating all the time. That part of the equation still hasn't been figured out how to do a, a truck stop with a high volume of vehicles. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's out there ways because the the solution set for electric vehicles right now is really looking at depot charging, what we call return to base charging. So the vehicles come back at night and then they, they hook up and they sit overnight anyway. And so now they're just charging overnight and the next day the driver picks it up and does his run, her run. So speaking of runs, NACFI, in partnership with the Rocky Mountain Institute, or RMI, did an electric truck demonstration recently called Run on Less Electric. We asked Mike to tell us a little bit about the demonstration and what they found. So this is our third Run on Less, and the Run on Less comes from, you know, Run on Less fuel. So we were looking, you know, in 2017 and 19, we did two, we don't have time to go through those, but it was to go find the hyper MPG truckers and how are they getting, you know, high, high fuel economy and, and efficiency. So in 2021, we knew we were going to do another run. And the idea of an electric truck run um, kept coming up and we kept saying no. And I remember one time I said no, even though the team wanted to do it, but I, I was saying no, because it just isn't kind of ready to, to be the run on less brand of uh, real trucks, real freight, real drivers for us to, you know, do this reality effort on around, you know, but um, we went off and, and got it and we did these 13. So what we did to get the 13 was go down to class three, all the way up to class eight. And interestingly enough, we ended up with three trucks that were step vans and vans, three box trucks, medium duty box trucks, and three terminal tractors. These are tractors that are, you know, in depots and in um, uh, warehouse yards and so forth, moving trailers around. Then we had four heavy duty trucks, one of which was beverage, um, where the electric truck could do the full day's work, and the other three um, couldn't really do a full day work of a diesel truck because the range and weight and cost aren't there quite yet. We had a nice um, mix of the 13 that participated, you know, in lots of different areas. And, um, you know, I think for me, a couple of things were, were, were big. One I mentioned a little earlier, and that is that the operations really like these trucks and they want to go fast. I mean, if you're out there trying to haul beer, get you know cargo containers off the ships and so forth do you really want to be testing a new technology i was out there asking them you know would you just rather not have these stupid electric trucks or these electric trucks you know i was trying to get them to tell me you know and then he really didn't they see the future they see the opportunity um you know they're taking selfies for their kids and grandkids and so they, they see they see that um that future but the other thing was um all of the benefits that are starting to emerge from these trucks. I mean, you know, the fact that you can uh, drive them into and through a warehouse with no exhaust. And so they don't have to have these exhaust systems that opens up other opportunities for freight movement and maybe even, um, you know, intermodal truck to truck sort of freight movement. If you can go through a, through a facility, 
Um, and, and just other, you know, it just, it just goes on and on where if you don't have the diesel, you don't have extra, all that lubrication, um, uh, oils, all that sort of thing. It just opens up uh, a lot of opportunities. And then finally, which was kind of one of our big findings in the, in the whole run was, um, you know, a lot of these trucks are electrifiable today. So when we dig in and, and we're digging into the data from the run right now, and we'll be issuing some reports in the spring, but you know, the, uh, they do return to base and um, time to charge. You know, I've said it a hundred times, not all trucks go 500 miles and need charging in 30 minutes. You know, there's a lot of trucks that come return to base and sit there parked all night long. And, um, you know, great place for slow charging and get that truck back out and uh, do its job. So, um, elect, you know, these smaller trucks are, are quite electrifiable today. So both Rick and Mike seem to think that electric is really the future of trucking, except for maybe the long haul heavy duty trucking, which could be hydrogen powered. But hydrogen infrastructure, it sounds, is a long way to go. So to get a better sense of the EV trucking industry, we talked with Jesse Lund, who, as we mentioned, worked last with NACP as an electric truck program manager and is now with CalStart. Our first question for Jesse was, what are electric truck sales like today? Mike made it sound like companies are scrambling for them. Are they just exploding? And you'll be able to hear Jesse's dog had something to say about it too. So shortish answer is sales are low today. I'd say less than 1% of new trucks today sold are electric. There's a few hundred electric trucks on the road across the U.S. today. Very few in the grand scheme of these like millions and millions of trucks on the road. That said, it is changing quickly again. <laughs> um, and the biggest reason I'd say is that until very recently, you could not go buy an electric truck. There weren't manufacturers offering them. It is still difficult today, and I want to acknowledge that, which is still holding back sales. If I'm a fleet who wants to go order 100 new electric trucks, that's very hard to do, particularly if I want to get them in the next year or even two with some of our supply chain challenges these days. But we are seeing a huge uptick in production of these vehicles. Some traditional manufacturers even starting to produce these at scale. Um, they've been doing a lot of research and development and testing with some key customers over the past few years. So again, I really do think we're at that tipping point in terms of production. We're also seeing new kind of market entrants coming into this sector, similar to what we've seen in the passenger car market, who have not made trucks traditionally, but are now only making zero emission trucks. And so I think there's been a lot of good competition between those traditional manufacturers and these new, these new market entrants really driving this technology to scale as quickly as possible. In terms of who's buying them, it tends to be larger fleets, folks who have the resources to not just buy the truck and the charging infrastructure, but to do the research, the analysis, the optimization we've been talking about. It's really not an easy thing these days. And I think also a lot of fleets who have pretty ambitious sustainability and or climate goals. I think that's been a lot of what's driving this, um, these truck sales to date. I think as we can get, again, those costs down, reach economies of scale, also as education reaches more of the industry, I think we'll start to see additional fleets making those choices, even just from a business perspective, particularly in geographies where there are incentives available. Cool. And just in terms of the owner landscape of trucks, I mean, obviously we all know how, you know, people own passenger vehicles, who owns, you know, the big fleets of trucks and other, you know, freight vehicles in the United States? Are these mostly corporations that own them to sell their own goods? Are these uh, third party owning, you know, fleets that are rented out? What, what's typically the ownership model in the trucking industry? Yeah, it's really all of the above. It does truly depend on the company. There are certainly what we call private fleets who own their own vehicles to haul their own um, freight. This tends to be a lot of the big consumer brands that we've heard of. Then there's also what we call the for hire side. So these are what they call carriers who are basically contracted by companies who need to have their cargo shipped from point A to point B and they'll hire these companies. Um, to do that. And so that could be everyone from the package delivery companies we're used to, UPS, FedEx, DHL, to some of the big, again, those names you'll see on the side of trailers on the highway, whether it's JV Hunt, Knight Swift, Schneider, um, some of the rental companies like Ryder and Penske. Those are some of the bigger fleets I think most of the audience might be familiar with. 
I'd like to go back to the topic of charging in the grid. If all class three to class eight trucks were electrified in North America, we have an estimate that this would require 168,000 gigawatt hours of electricity from the grid, which is about 5% of total demand today. What kind of development needs to happen with the grid to enable this kind of charging at scale? For the most part, in terms of like transmission lines of the grid, we're there, we're already ramping up generation of electricity, particularly with renewables. We're figuring out the battery storage piece in order to balance those renewables. Um, but I think where we are gonna need to see a lot of investment in the grid is what, what you'll hear referred to as the make ready infrastructure. And so basically that's where the transmission line steps down, really gets into the distribution side of the grid. So it's not that there's not power on the grid, it's that maybe the lines coming from those transmission lines to your particular site might not be able to have the capacity that you'll need to charge these trucks at the speed that these fleets will require. And so that's where we'll see investments made in terms of you know, new transformers, new wiring conduit, certainly some new substations in certain areas, those sorts of investments. Yeah, I'm hearing it's more of a local problem rather than a global problem, which has been the case for a lot of distributed renewables. So depot charging versus over the road charging, how do you think about this infrastructure growing if you can put a timeline on it? Yeah, I mean, I think it is going to happen faster than a lot of folks think, particularly as we're able to achieve kind of economies of scale and see the price of these vehicles and the charging come down. But I, I think those sectors that I just mentioned could scale relatively quickly, particularly as we see production of those vehicles go up and fleets are able to actually go purchase them and get them on the road. Um, I think longer scale timeline wise, we, it will take a bit longer to reach the like longer regional haul applications or the long haul or line haul, like the, the heavy duty trucks traveling across the country on the highway. Those are not a good fit today. And we'll really need to see batteries improve in order to get there, as well as that public charging be built out to support that. I think, you know, the next few years, it will really be focused on these shorter haul and more medium duty segments, whereas um, probably out by 2030, we're expecting a significant number of even those heavy duty long haul trucks to start electrifying. That was Jesse Lund, Rick Mihalik, and Mike Roth from the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. So, Darren, I was sort of surprised that, you know, Rick and Mike, you know, really all three of them were so bullish on the future of electric trucking. And, you know, that some of these other technologies like hydrogen were just didn't see, you know, there just wasn't sort of as much enthusiasm as I thought, you know, perhaps there might be, you know, particular for longer haul trucking but why do you think why do you think that that is yeah i I was frankly a little surprised too because you know there there are a lot of people who still say that hey long haul trucking is going to take a long very long time to electrify and hydrogen may be a more energy dense carrier Uh, it seems like from what rick was saying that it's really the litany of other challenges it's not so much hydrogen in the trucks it's about the cost of liquefying and compressing it the cost of transporting it to the gas stations and whether there is sufficient demand in trucking alone to make hydrogen cost competitive. So I guess something that I'm picking up from the hydrogen space is that, and trucking space is that, you know, trucking, despite its importance to the industry and despite its impact on emissions, the sales volumes is just not particularly high compared to other applications. And that's why if you're depending on just the trucking sector, to generate demand for something, it's going to be very hard to get down the cost curve. Another factor that I thought was interesting that I don't know that people who haven't actually, you know, driven trucking routes would pick up on is just how important things like the weight of the truck are, you know, and keeping that down and how important it is that the truck be designed without a lot of moving parts, you know, that it's as compactly constructed as as possible because of all of the wear and tear and all of the forces on the truck as it's driving. So all of these these other factors also combine, you know, perhaps to make electric vehicles really the the preferred route as opposed to other technologies, which might, you know, yeah. raise complexity. You know, it's interesting because one of the arguments for hydrogen trucking is that 
oh, you don't have this really heavy battery you're carrying with you all this time. Um, so from a weight perspective, it seems like at least a uh, break even, but maybe something that's, uh, you know, to your point, with a hydrogen uh, drivetrain, maybe you have more components that aren't necessarily in an electric truck, and maybe that makes it more complex. I'm not an expert in the manufacturing of these vehicles, but I could see that potentially being a challenge. Right. And one other thing that I've heard, which was surprising, I recently watched a Sandy Monroe video on Nikola. And in that video, the engineers were saying that they were uh, doing a lot of R&D right now to get hydrogen refueling times to be as low as 15 minutes and they made it sound like it was a really awesome accomplishment to do that but i was actually taken aback i thought that the whole point of hydrogen was to be able to refuel much more quickly than battery electric 15 minutes is still pretty fast compared to batteries but not significantly so so maybe that also indicates that there actually is a lot more immaturity in this technology than we thought mm -hmm. yeah That's it for this episode of the podcast. You can check out our other interviews, watch our videos, and sign up for our newsletter at climatenow.com. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, email us at contact at climatenow.com or tweet us at weareclimatenow. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation.